Okay. So, all right. So the other day I started talking, I, I'm particularly referring to this as transformers and power systems, right? In particular, because um, I'm talking about 60 Hertz transformers, right? Things that are large. All right. And the intention on Friday is to actually look at these things so we can kind of understand that I'm not making up what I'm saying. All right. Uh, and you guys can see it. So we're not going to talk about this again really much with respect to transformers, the mutual inductance model. We will use this when we start looking at motors, which we will do soon. Okay. The ideal transformer, number two here. All right. Um, the ideal transformer would, what makes a transformer ideal? No power loss. No power loss is one element of it. Yeah. No flux leakage. There's no flux leakage, right? The, basically, the mu of the core is infinite. So the job of the core, which we'll look at and review on, on in the lab, basically is that if I apply a voltage on one side, and this gets to the question you guys were just discussing on the homework, I put a voltage on one side, that creates a B field. That happens through Faraday's law, right? Creates a B field in the core. All of that B field that's created by coil one makes it through to coil two. So coil two mm -hmm. now basically is supplying a voltage to whatever's connected on that side. All right, we're gonna look at some examples of where that happens all right, later. All right, then I talk about the real transformer. All right, what made it real? Well, the fact that there's leakage. And now notice about this, I got two, two versions of this, the real transformer and the real transformer with losses. Here, I just, this is what we derived from the magnetic circuit model. So we did, we had, so we had two steps for these things. Any of these are magnetic devices, electromagnetic devices. We had two steps. We want a circuit model so we can understand how these things behave in an electrical circuit. What we did is we start out with a magnetic circuit. So we say we got an MMF that makes a flux. We convert that to a flux linkage. Then we use what law to get to an electrical circuit model? What, what takes us from fluxes to electrical circuits? Faraday's law, right? Which is what? V, yeah, V equals D flux by DT. So we, we usually do V equals D lambda by DT. So I didn't really write that here, or did I? What did I write here? So this is my flux linkage. What is this? That's not a D lambda by DT. It sort of is. What is it? Phasor domain. Yeah, so my D, D by DT is your J omega. What's implied in the phasor domain? Steady state and what? Sinusoidal, right? I have to have a sinusoidal system. In other words, I can't have, to, for it to really apply, I can't have a Fourier series, right? I have to have a steady state with a single frequency. All right, and I got all my parameters here. So just real quick, um, which of these is bigger, the leakage inductance or the magnetizing inductance? Which one? If you think about what's happening, this is the way I think from a circuit, we can think about it from a couple of perspectives. From a circuit perspective, if I put a voltage source on V1, L leak one and L mag are sort of a voltage divider, right? What would I want to have happen with this thing? Well, ideally I want it to be an ideal transformer, right? So where would I want V1 to appear? I would want V1 to appear entirely across L mag, wouldn't I? So what would that mean about L leak one and L mag, which one should be bigger? L mag, right? So L mag in general should be much, much bigger than L leak one. And you see that in these formulas here, if you pay close attention to them, because you look at the reluctance of the core, ideally, what should the reluctance of the core be? All right, so the mu of the core is supposed to be really high. If the mu is really high, that makes the reluctance what? really small. So this will be zero, hopefully, or close to zero, right? So the L mag will be big. Whereas the leakage paths hopefully have a pretty small reluctance. Think of this as a, as a magnetic circuit, as an electric circuit, right? I want the current to go through the reluctance of the core, so that should be small. I don't want it to go through the reluctance of the air, right? And so I hope that this is a big number, right? So base, basic idea is I hope that L mag is going to be much, much bigger than the leakage. And we'll look at that in the lab. RC. Those are reluctances there. Oh, reluctant yeah, yeah, yeah. I get these little fancy script R's there. I try to use that to rec to represent the reluctance as much as I can. Now here, all right. 
this is where I've added in the losses. So I've got the core loss, the primary side loss, and the secondary side loss. So RP and RS here, the primary side, secondary side loss. What are those? The resistances. But what do they represent physically? They are the represent representation of what? You'll lose something for a while. Well, you got the right idea. This so basically the thing to remember with this is this is an electrical circuit model for a physical device that has windings. So in other words, looking into the primary winding, I have this electrical circuit model. So what's RP and RS? It's the resistance of what? I put them in series like that. He's so right. The core? Not the core. This is the core. These guys are basically of the wire that is leading into this thing, right? So there's there's wires on the core, right? So there's resistance in this wire and there's resistance in that wire. So it's like you said, the transmission line law. It's basically the resistance of that of the wire, line. of the line, of the actual wrappings, yeah. And you can, you can rationalize why those would be in series with the circuit, okay? Um, I, I don't want to focus on derivations. You should be able to kind of rationalize this because essentially what it says is I can kind of think of any voltage drop across that resistance as basically reducing what's ultimately going to make it to this ideal transformer. All right. And you could derive that, but essentially this is, this is the model that we use. Okay. All right. Now, the other thing that we talked about the other day is this notion of impedance reflection. So I did a derivation the other day. It's in the notes that I posted the other day, the lecture video I posted, blah, blah, blah. Basically what it says is if I put an impedance Z on the secondary side, then that from the perspective of the terminals here on the primary, I can reflect that impedance across the transformer. And I reflect it through the turns ratio squared. Now I could also go the opposite direction, right? So something on... The primary side could be reflected to the secondary side. What do you think I would use to reflect something on the primary side to the secondary side? You would swap in one and two. I would swap in one and n two in that equation. All right. So this is an important relationship when we. All right, and then I went even further and I said, "Well, I'm going to make another summary here that says I can approximate some things." So what I did was I took the model that I made here. So let's compare this model to the one on the top there. What did I do? Well, I did two things, right? Can you move the, uh, the leak to the two over? Yep. So what I did was I reflected the leakage stuff over. All right. Did you combine? And I combined it. The other thing I did was I moved the magnetizing inductance and the core loss to the front. Now that's not perfectly true, but I said that I can typically do this because I sub E is pretty close to zero, or really what I should say is I sub E is much, much less than I one. So if you have 10, your voltage is V1. Most of your current's going to go down RC1. Does that mean your voltage for No, so RC1? what we what we said the other day, so this is I'm saying I sub E is much, much smaller than I one. What we know right here, and I wrote it, I wrote it down here. <clears throat> if this is I1, this is IE, and this is I2 prime, by KCL I have I1 equals IE plus I2 prime. Right. What did I say about I sub E? These are really big impedances relative to these guys. So if, if the magnetizing and the core are much bigger than these guys, it should be the case that once, once I'm kind of in a loaded condition, we say that I sub E is, is much, much smaller than I1. <clears throat> and in general, I sub E, because these resistances are really big, I sub E is really small. All right, now that's why I want to take you in the lab so you can actually see that, right? When I look at this thing, you'll see that when the transformer is unloaded, I measure I sub E. And we we did, you can go back and look at the numbers from Monday. I did an example with some numbers. Those currents are really tiny. Because it's so small, it's kind of arbitrary where I place it. It doesn't matter too much. 
right? It says that the voltage drop across the, the impedance that was up here didn't matter then. Right, basically what it's saying. And you could sit, you could take some numbers and prove that. We sort of did the other day. So my question is for the voltage, isn't voltage the uh, voltages are the same and stuff's in the parallel? Does that mean that the amount of voltage that's uh, going across V1 is the same that's going across that parallel combination? Yeah. That's the same. The the yeah, the voltage across XM1 and RC1 are the same there. Does that mean the voltage across RC1 is the same as V1? Mm -hmm. That's just KVL, right? It's not, I mean, you can remember it as the voltage across things in parallel is the same, or just remember it as KVL. That's the way I like, I mean, no, I didn't know if you yeah. were making an assumption with them. Thinking. No, I mean, this, this, you know, there's no assumptions about what you just said. That's just a statement. What you just said was KVO for this circuit. The assumption is I put it in the wrong spot. I did something you can't do in circuits. So I, I just, I said, ah, I'm going to move this branch up to the front. And I can do that because basically what I'm saying is this resistance is so small that it kind of doesn't matter whether it's here or there. That's not like, you know, if you did that in circuits, Yahoo would you know, lose lots of points, right? But but I, from an engineering perspective, that's a reasonable thing to do because the, the value is insignificant. What I get for I sub E, this current, is going to be like 1% different if I move it, is, is what I'm saying. And in reality, what we often do, what we're going to see here is that when the circuit is loaded, Right. In other words, when I put a load on the secondary side, and we're going to see what that means today. When I put a load on the secondary side, this current over here, I sub E, is so much smaller than I want that we typically ignore that branch anyway. That branch matters if there's nothing on this side, but a transformer in the power system would be pretty useless if it wasn't loaded. Duke's not going to invest in a transformer that's got nothing on the secondary. So normally it's loaded, right? So, so we don't typically worry about that. Now, there's conditions that happen when it does, and that's actually a big thing with a lot of solar plants and things like that nowadays, but we don't, we don't worry about that in most operations. Okay. All right. Now, to spice it up a little bit more, I can do it two different ways. Um, so that model on the top is, is the one that, that I showed previously. I can reflect everything on the primary side to the secondary side. All right, and we can represent the model either way on the primary side and the secondary side. So you'll notice these guys here are all the same ones that I have in the top, except I just drew everything on the other side. Now, everything here has a subscript one, everything here has a subscript two. So the top one, I'm saying all the parameters are on the referred to the primary. Here, I say they're all referred to the second. So how do I get from one to the next? For anything with a two, how can I get from something with a one subscript? Yeah. Yep, basically with that turns ratio relationship. Okay. All right, that's going to be the core relationship that we will need to use. Why do we want the first thing over to the right if we want the second carry just tap the road? All, all depends on how we're trying to solve the circuit, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Cases where I could look at it either way, right? All right. Um, and then, you know, basically what, and this is what we'll see in the lab. Um, talked about this the other day. Typically when the thing is unloaded, meaning I put a voltage source here, all that's going to be happening is the voltage is on the secondary, but there's no current over there. If I apply a voltage, it looks like this. I get a flux that looks like this. You got homework problems that deal with that, right? And I'm going to get a current. It looks like that. Now, I keep calling this guy I sub E. The E means exciting current. It's the current that's required to do what? The current that's required to excite the transformer. In other words, to make the field happen inside the transformer. If this thing was ideal. There would be no current required to make that happen. It would just magically happen. All right. But because it is, the, there is basically, I have to quote unquote magnetize the core, and there's some current that goes into that process. Yeah. So the wave on the right, is that a combination of the flux and the current, or is that just the wave? This, this curve here? Yeah, that little weird thing. This is that, what I call BH curve, right? This is basically the properties of the device coming into play. 
So the fact that the device itself, that the material, the core material has this BH relationship. In other words, we know that we're supposed to have B equals mu H, right? It's supposed to. What we said is that for, for iron, for a real magnetic material, it actually looks something like this. And what I what this what this is showing is that well B can be related to phi, H can be related to I. So those should look that way. So actually, what we'll do is we we can measure this, and, and that's what we'll do in the lab. I'm going to measure the flux by measuring the voltage. Because what's the difference between the flux and the voltage? A 90 degree phase shift, right? So I can measure the voltage that relates to the flux. I can measure the current. And I can put them on an oscilloscope together, and it'll trace out that curve on the oscilloscope. So that whole thing is two different lines. But we just connected them for the sake of making a graph. What? No, this this is a property of the material, and what it's saying is is if my flux, so I put a voltage on that creates a flux. Once that flux is in the material, as that flux changes, basically what's happening is that over time, we're going to traverse around that curve. This curve is a property of the material. As a result of this, the current going into the thing looks like that. So I apply this voltage to create this field, and as a result, the current looks like that. An ugly current comes out because of the flux. Why is it going to be ugly? The reason it's ugly is because as the flux gets to be a bigger and bigger value, the core is saturating, meaning its mu value is decreasing. So that L, so if I go through that real slow, basically L mag is dropping. So more current is going to go in. The problem is not L mag. What sucks about L mag or this XM1 branch? This guy is L mag. L mag is a is basically a is not a constant value. In other words, he is not constant. If I put more B field into this thing, the L mag actually starts to drop, which is going to draw more current, which is why this guy gets this kind of sharp peak looking thing. All right. And, and that's what we'll see, not uh, constant, constant. Right. It's, it's helpful to, to see that, I think, and that's why we'll, we'll do it that way. Right. All right, now where we ended the other day is I said, you know what? It turns out no one ever knows all those parameters. Right. What they do is, is we're going we're gonna to look at what they get, but if, the, if at best, what they're going to have is they're going to do two tests on a transformer. An open circuit test, and a short circuit test. And so these are the two the so if I, we're gonna walk through these real quick with an example. But what I do is I apply the rated voltage on the primary side, and I can use that to figure out the core parameters. And then I apply rated current and short circuit the secondary, and I can figure out those leakage parameters. Now, why does that work? Well, well, let's try it out, all right? So here I had a transformer that's rated for 20 kVA. I keep saying rated. What's that mean? Well, what that means is the two ratings that I typically get, all right? We're gonna look at some real transformer data here in a little bit. I get a kVA rating, which means I get a, what, what's the term we use for the, when we say kVA, the magnitude of S? S is complex power, but I give the magnitude of S a name too. Combination it's a combination, but I give it a name. What's the name apparent. we give it? Apparent power. Yeah. So we get so it's called the apparent power. So I have the apparent power rating of it. And what this says is I get a voltage rating. So it says 8,000 volts rated on the primary, 240 volts rated on the secondary. That means you're supposed to hook it up to 8,000 volts and get 240 on the other side. If I hook that up, if I want to figure out the maximum current, I use the rating. Okay, so if I want to figure out the rated current on the primary side, right, I would say um, basically the magnitude of S is equal, so is equal to V primary rated times I primary rated. Right, that's how I would get the rated current on this thing. So I say this is 8,000 volts times I primary rated is equal to the rated value of 20 kVA. If I do that math, I'm going to get that the primary rated current is equal to what? Uh, 2.5 amps. Okay. So in the open circuit test for this example transformer, I applied the rated voltage. 
I measured this current, 2.14 amps, pretty small. And then I also measured the power. That's a weird thing. So we're actually going to do that in the lab when we go in there too. We're going to measure the power, right? And I measured 400 watts. Now on the short circuit test, I applied less voltage and I got the rated current. The power at that time was 240 watts. All right, so let's look at the circuit in the two cases. So this is the open circuit test, right? I applied VOC. I, so in this words, I, I applied 8,000 volts in this case. And it tells me that what I measured there was, what did I say, 2.214? And I measured with a power meter that the power going into this thing was 400 watts. Now, where is that power being burned up? In this circuit, how much current is there over on the secondary side? Zero. There's, yep, no current here. This guy is also zero. Yep, everything's going down. So the POC, the power, the watts that I measured, which was apparently 400 watts in this case, where's that being burned up? The resistor. So how would I figure that out? How would I figure the value of that resistor? I wouldn't be able to figure that out with a multimeter. Because this is a this is weird. This is we're not going to be able to figure that out at all. Because if I put a multimeter on there, you'll see what I'm going to find out is the, the winding resistance. How much how much resistance is there in that wire? This resistance is resistance that exists inside of the core. It represents basically what's happening inside the core. Like there's no there's no actual physical resistor. It's basically the fact that if I if I apply a voltage to the primary of the transformer, the core is hot. It represents the fact that power going into that winding is creating a magnetic field that is spinning all the little dipoles around and creating heat. And we model that electrically as a, as that resistance. It represents the heat in the core. Right, that is created by the magnetic field in the core, but it's not a real resistor. It's a model for what the what the field is doing. No, I mean, but does that mean you're like looking at the model? Mm -hmm. If you can figure out what's going through that resistor, that will let you know theoretically how hot your core is going to get. Yeah, yeah, and I could I could do some modeling on that, and that's actually a, I don't want to get lost in this, but that's an important thing that you know I might want to know that to track how hot the core is going to get, and maybe if it's going to fail. So there's a lot of talk nowadays about doing that maybe for the distribution transformer that feeds a bunch of houses if they go and plug in a bunch of EVs. Because if they plug in the electric vehicles, I might go above the rate of current. But maybe I, maybe that's okay, because what's going to happen is the transformer is going to get hotter. Maybe as long as I can manage that, maybe it's okay. All right, so so that, yeah, it's a good point, right? Is the That resistance represents the heat that's being generated. It says that, hey, if I just go ahead and put 8,000 volts on the primary, it's like, you know, 400 watt light bulbs suddenly got powered up from just the heat of the core. Right. And that could be a bad thing. Well, the temperature gauge wouldn't tell me the resistance that I'm, right. Yeah, but it, it, I, I could relate that to what the temperature rise is going to be, but there's that's also a dynamic thing. There's the temperature would rise slowly to some point. I could relate that to a resistance, but this this gets into me more directly. Yeah. And if we have a load on it, like we can see at the corner. There'd be heat in both places. Yeah. You would. However, it starts to matter not that much. All right. Let's let's get through let's get through the, the results. You guys are asking good questions, but if I if I gave you this POC. How would I get to that R sub C value? How can I figure out that resistance? You know the voltage, yeah. So we know that VOC, basically V squared over R, right? VOC squared over the resistance of the core, right? So I'm just doing what I know from, uh, from circuits one, right? And if I go through that process right there, I'm gonna get that that value is, what do you think it's gonna be without doing the numbers? Is it gonna be big or small? It should, the, well, the losses should be small and the current should be small, but the resistance should be really big, right? The current should be small, but the resistance should be big. So the resistance actually works out to be 160K, right? It's actually quite, 
large, but the current the current's very small as a result, right? Um, this is one of the things that's tricky. If I want a small current, it's a big resistance here. Right? So if we multiply RC by IC, we should get eight thousand degrees. Yeah, but we don't know what IC is, and I'll never know what IC is because it, I, there is no place where I can measure that current. What I'm saying is, this is a real test I would do. I'll apply a voltage, see what's going on. Only things I could actually measure is basically the voltage I'm applying to the core or to the winding and the current that's going into that winding and the power that's going into that winding. I can measure those three things. I can't measure anything else. I, I can't get access to these things. I can't. These are just models. They exist inside of this, this model. Okay. So, but to that point, let's say that I, I mean, I could calculate I sub C, but I can't measure it. Now, what I can do here, how could I measure, how could I figure out what X sub M is? With the, the overall, like, so I want to figure out what this impedance is. In other words, I want to figure out the imaginary part there is. What would I need to know to figure that out? There's going to be a similar relationship to this one, right? I need Q. How do I get Q? All I have is VOC, IOC, and POC. Bingo. Yep. Yep. The magnitude of S is VOC magnitude times IOC magnitude. Uh, if I do that calculation, I come up with 1712 volt amps. Wait, wouldn't that be P, not S? Trying to find the power. We know the power. V, v times I is not power. It's apparent power. Right? So that tells me the volt amps. And then what I what I can do then is I can say, well, you know, S, the complex vector is P plus JQ. Right? And I can use Pythagoras or whatever to figure everything out. So if I if I do that and use Pythagoras, I get the Q, and I guess I should call this O C because it's the open circuit condition, all right? What I get is the QOC, and I'm not gonna go through that math. You guys should know how to do that at this point. This is 1.6646 K bar, okay? Now, how do I use that then to figure out what X sub M is? So I've got QOC, how do I use that to figure out what X sub M is? Same process. VOC over the imaginary part of the impedance. And so I get that X sub M. All right, again, big or small? What do we expect it to be? Big. We expect, we expect the, the impedances in this parallel branch to be big because we don't expect much current to be going through, right? So I, you're, you're right in the, yeah, you were kind of right in your thinking, yeah. I expect the current to be small. So that means the impedance has to be big. So that this guy works out to be, in this case, 38.447 kilo ohms. Be way bigger than the leakage stuff ever is, right, as we'll see. All right. Now, how would I get the rest of this? Well, what I do is I apply a short circuit on the secondary. Now, why would I not apply a short circuit? And just to be clear here, notice what I'm doing. I turned the voltage down when I did this. In other words, I didn't apply the full voltage, 8,000 volts. What I did was I applied the rated current. All right, the rated current was 2.5 amps. So the rated current and the short circuit current the same? Or just do I so the thing is, yeah, the thing, so, I want to be clear about this. When I say short circuit current here, this the, we we give these tests names. So I call it the open circuit test and I call it the short circuit test. So what I do is I apply an open circuit to get two parameters. And then I apply a short circuit on the other side of the transformer to figure out the other parameters. So this is not necessarily the current that I would get if I had a short circuit, but during this short circuit test, during this controlled test, this is the current that I get. And what I do is I apply just the right amount of voltage, which is apparently 489 volts, to get that I short circuit is 2.5 amps. 
why would I not apply just the full 8,000 volts? It'd be a lot more current than 2.5 amps, right? It would be a dangerously high level of current. The transformer would be wildly saturated. There'd be, um, you know, for stuff on fire, right? There is, it, it is not normal. You don't run a transformer at 10 times the rated current. What's going to happen? It's going to heat up too much and it's going to catch on fire, right? So we, this, we're starting to deal with, you know, real engineering issues here of I don't run things over their ratings. I run things at their ratings. And so that in this case, if I'm putting a short circuit on there, I just do it very carefully. So when we find IP that told us where I short circuit is. It, it did. When I told you the rated KVA and I told you the, the voltage rating, I've told you what the rated current is at that point. Okay. So, all right. So in this test, I'm telling you V short circuit, I short circuit, and the power. Okay. So I have that I short circuit is apparently 2.5 amps. And V short circuit is apparently uh, 489 volts. And the power in this case, 240 watts. Power short circuit. What are 240 watts? 240. 240, yeah. Okay. All right. Where is I short circuit going? So at this node right here, I short circuit equals, so this current, gotta be careful, magnitude here. Well, let me, let me do it finished. I short circuit equals IE plus I2 prime. Right. I2 prime is this current. What do we say is true under this condition when I'm in rated conditions here? What's true about the exciting current? What's true about the current going down this branch? Well, it's pretty small. And we basically say that's about zero. So basically there's no current running through that guy, through that branch. So where's the power being burned up now? When you say the coil, so the, this guy right here, right? That resistance, right? And sometimes, I, and I did this in my summary, usually I call this REQ. Because it's on the primary side, I usually call it REQ1. And because this guy is on the primary, I say XEQ1, like that. Okay. So, how would I do that? Power short circuits, 240 watts. How would I relate that to the measurements I have? So, so there's no current going down here. It's like these guys don't exist. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, so I'm basically saying, okay, this has to be zero. I'm, I'm saying that's so small relative to the rest of it that if there's 2.5 amps here, there's probably 2.48 there. So small, but it's negligible. So. Well, you get no current in the secondary. I do have current on the secondary because it's short circuited now. I don't have voltage. I can have current, but I don't have any voltage. So what's the volt? So I have a short circuit on the secondary, right? So that voltage there is zero. So what's the voltage on the primary? Voltage. Zero, yeah. So if I think about the circuit, I have basically VSC, and then I have this REQ1, and I have this XEQ1. Basically the circuit simplifies to that. So what's the short circuit power have to be in this case? I can't they're in series. So, but I know that the current, I know what the current is, right? Oh, I squared. Yep. So I know it's I short circuit squared magnitude, right? Times REQ. And I keep calling it REQ1 because it's on the primary side, the one side. And that works out to be if I do the math. REQ1 is 38.4 
homes, way smaller. Like it should be, because what is it? It's basically just copper resistance. Right? That should be small. It's just wire. Now, how would I get XEQ1? So again, our circuit simplifies to this. And I know that current. How would I get? How would I get? So the magnitude of it. How would I get XEQ one? So we just found what the power was, correct? Yeah. We knew what the power was. Oh, so we're starting off the assumption that we. Was... You're oh so the and this yeah list this in the summary there, but I'm always given. In the short circuit test, the voltage, the current, the power. Voltage current power. Because I can measure those pretty easily. Yeah. And again, you guys probably never seen power measured, probably never seen current measured, right? So we're going to do that. We should see how we do that in the lab, right? Because it's interesting and useful to know that. All right. How would I figure out XEQ1? Same as we did before. Yeah. So basically, I, I can calculate what the parent power is which is V short circuit magnitude times I short circuit magnitude. And that then works out to be, uh, if I do that calculation, I didn't write that down, but it's not that important. Once I have that number, I know that the S short circuit, right, is basically P short circuit, which we were given plus J Q short circuit. I use Pythagoras and I get the Q value is, in this case, 1.1987 K bar, like that. And if I do the math, I get that X E Q works out to be 191.8, all right? Now what math did I do to get that? I said this is 191.8. Nine three six ohms. What math did I do to get that x e q? Well, so I did Pythagoras to get the q. What i squared r? Yeah. So because I got a series connection here in this circuit, it would be i squared r. So in other words, I have that basically q short circuit would be magnitude of i short circuit squared times x eq and i solve for that okay. all right so there's a summary of the parameters that i get in other words i can't really figure out r1 and r2 right but what i can figure out is what the equivalent parameters are and the important thing when i when i look at this um again i got 2.5 amps going in here there was about 0.2 amps going this way what, what we ultimately do whenever we use a real transformer is we generally don't even talk about x sub m and r sub c they're there we need them to make a flux happen but the notion is that most of the current going into the transformer should represent current that ultimately is getting itself transferred to the secondary side all right so we usually ignore that all right so let's talk about where we use this now so i want to jump ahead for a second here i'm going to come back to a couple of things all right here's a picture um of a distribution system okay so what is this what's a distribution system um this is basically the 24 kv system uh, that's that runs through wilmington north carolina all right so if you can pay close attention you can picture this in the map this is the atlantic ocean here all right and this is the cape fear river on the side all right um <clears throat> so what what you have here basically all those lines those are, those are the 24 kV lines that are running through the distribution network. So when you drive down the road and you see wooden poles overhead with three wires on them, there might be some telephone lines or whatever on there too, cable, whatever. But when you see a three-phase three line, you see three wires running through, that's basically what you're seeing. Now, at some points in that network, what you're going to see is one of those cans up on the pole, right? Those cans basically take that 24 kV down to 240 volts, the low voltage side. And so for that, what I would see, if I click on 
all throughout this, you can't see it, but I can, if I click on one of these little things, there's basically a load down there. And what's a load? What well, a load looks like this. So this node, all right, basically what I have, and this, this is what a load looks like in a, in a diagram like this. What I see down here, this is probably the useful information to me. All right, so what it tells me is that this load that I picked out, wherever that is in the network, is on phase C. So it's a bunch of houses. In this case, it looks like it is apparently nine customers, so nine houses, basically, nine meters that sit there. And apparently, this guy is expecting 54.73 kW at a power factor of 93%, 0 0.93. So what that says is probably on the hottest afternoon in the summer, they expect this guy to be at 54 kW. That's how much load they expect to be on the secondary side. So when the air conditioner is cranking, or actually, I need to be careful, this is winter. So what it actually, what it actually expects is when the heat pumps are grinding away at 6 a.m. when it's you know 20 degrees outside or 10 degrees outside, that there's 54 um, kW coming out. And I can use the power factor to figure out whatever else. So those nine customers apparently, I don't know that they're going to look that way because they not, may not be home right that day. But if they're all home or whatever, that's what I would expect it to be. Okay. All right. So in terms of the data that I would get for these things, this is sort of for a pole-mounted transformer. Notice I put a 25 kVA transformer. So what I have here is, is for a typical transformer that says, so it's single phase, the 25 kVA. Um, there's a bunch of data here. It tells me that this guy is rated for 120 slash 240. Okay. 120 slash 240 at a capacity of 25 kVA. And then over here, it tells me the primary voltage. So 13,200 is the primary voltage. That's pretty common. Is that for? What what this is, yeah, the, the saying 13200 is the full voltage and 240 is the full voltage that I would have. If I apply this across the full primary, I get this across the full primary. So it's one or the other, not a one. It's, yeah, I don't, without getting too lost in that. We'll talk about this actually when we look in the lab. I would think of it as a 30, 13200 to 240. And that's a pretty common number. I kept saying in this, this would this is 24 kV. In this part, at least this part of the Duke network, not all parts of it, but in this part of the Duke network, most of it's 24 kV. Somewhere else it may be different. Right. Maybe 13, 13 2. Okay. Um, all right. Now, one of the things you notice here in my ratings is it tells me some funky things. So it tells me the impedance approximately is 3%. A weird number, all right? Doesn't tell me anything in ohms, but that's the we, way we typically have it. And what I want to talk about a little bit is this notion of the per unit system, all right? It is meaningless for me to say that what's the voltage at some point in the system, that it's 472.6 volts. That doesn't mean a whole lot to somebody. What we typically do, and I took this as an example, this is, we'll talk about motors later, right? This is a set of induction motors in a plant. All right, and they're, what are they doing in this particular case? They're crushing wood uh, to make wood pellets. And so I took a picture of their automation screen and I basically tried to highlight these two motors right here. And I zoomed in on them with this picture. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is these values right here, right? So it says 69% FLA. What it's trying to say is that those motors are running at 69% of their rated current. FLA, we'll talk about that later, means full load amps. So it's running at 69% of its full load amps. Because if I'm the control room guy, I don't really give, give a crap whether that number is 148 amps. What I care about is, is it 100% of rated or 200% of rated? That's bad if it's 200% of its rated value. It's running twice as high as it's rated to operate at. 69% is where they want it to be in this particular case. All right. So it's actually useful to talk about things as a percentage value of the rated much more so than it is to actually talk about the specific numbers, right? So if I say that this transformer here is rated for 240 volts, yeah, I want the voltage to be at 240, 
if it's operating properly, or at 100% of it's rated. The reason for this is because the standards that are out there is the voltage is allowed to go within plus, let's say plus or minus 10% of its rated value. So what's plus or minus 10% of 240 volts? Well, it's plus or minus 24. People don't want to be sitting there doing the math and saying, well, if it's, if it's 238, is that okay? If it's 232, is that okay? They say, yeah, what is it in the percentage basis? So we use what's called the per unit system. And we basically, we, rep, we define what we call a base voltage and a base power and a base current and a base impedance. And we use those values to represent what's going on. So real quick, we'll wrap this up on Friday. All right, and we'll, we'll look at some examples. Well, what I'll do is for something like this, this transformer here, this is a 50 kVA transformer pad mount. So this is like the green thing you would have on the ground. You would have this in an underground distribution system. So this guy is 50 kVA capacity. Um, and apparently in this particular case, um, he has 13,200 volts on his primary, okay? So I call that his primary voltage base. And his base power, because this system, that the distribution system fed by these homes should not exceed 100% of 50 kVA, right? So that's the rated power. What's the rated on the secondary? The rated on the secondary is what? Um, 240. All right. And then how would I calculate the base current? Well, I do that basically by saying it's the S divided by the V, right? How would I do that for the impedance? Well, I could say it's the magnitude of the S squared, right? So divided by uh, what? So S squared should basic, well, sorry, S should be V squared over a z right so essentially i get that so i can do it that way these the whatever the magnitude of the voltage base squared is divided by s like that and we can do the same thing on the secondary side all right so we're out of time for today you guys asked good questions so that slowed me down a little bit but that means that um, we will be here i think on on uh friday and we will go to the lab on Monday. I'll stop there. Um.